And I'm also a member of the Global Leaders Group, which has been working on the issue of uh, antimicrobial uh, resistance, AMR. Uh, we see it as a very, very dire issue, something that is very often called um, a silent pandemic. And it's called a silent pandemic for the very reason that, you know, unlike um, what we what we saw in the case of COVID-19, this is a pandemic which would uh, which is as serious, if even more. Um, it's as much an existential threat as much as climate change, but it's much more silent. Um, just imagine the fact that medicines that we take, life-saving medicines, become um, the the bacteria becomes resistant to it. Um, um, it's a prospect uh, that should worry us because it 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 really means that uh, medicines will become ineffective. Uh, antimicrobials would become ineffective. So we at CSC are calling this um, 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 are calling um, on the research that we have done um, a triple jeopardy, and we call this a triple jeopardy for the for the fact that there are three key issues that are now emerging in the in in when we discuss the issue of AMR. The first, as I have just discussed with you, is the issue of AMR itself bugs getting, bacteria getting resistant, and medicines getting ineffective. And therefore the challenges about conservation, about better use of the medicines, about making sure that we do not allow misuse of anti, um, antimicrobials, antibiotics. But there is a related um, crisis which is also there, which is the, the discussion for the webinar today the second part of this triple jeopardy, which is the fact that we are, we are now seeing that there is less and less research development in uh, finding novel um, antimicrobials, antibiotics for the future. In fact, we find big pharma moving out of uh, research and development in the case of um, 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 antibiotics. We also find that the pipeline um, of new drugs and particularly novel uh, classes of anti um, antibiotics is drying up. And this is even more a concern when you look at what WHO calls the priority pathogens, the pathogens against which we need to find new classes of antimicrobials, antibiotics, because these are the ones that are the most, um, um, you know, they, they are the ones that cause the maximum disease in the world, infectious diseases in the world. I mean, are, are, sorry, these are the uh, medicines that are used to treat the, um, the um, most uh, serious infectious diseases in the world. And so if these medicines are becoming ineffective. We need a new class of medicines which can uh, target the pathogens. Now, this is the second part of the triple jeopardy, but it is also related to what we call the third part which is about access. Uh, we know that vast parts of the world need access to um, antimicrobials and they need to get this at affordable costs. So cost issues become equally important. Access becomes equally important. So even as we find ways to incentivize uh, the development of novel antimicrobials, that development of new antimicrobials has to be linked with the issue of affordability of access. And that makes it even more complicated. But we need to understand what is happening and what needs to be done. And so what we are doing at CSE as part of the effort to really uh, both understand what is happening, bring together some of the key players to help us to understand the situation better, and then draw upon their knowledge to really understand what then is the way ahead. 
So this is the first of a three-part series that my colleagues, um, Amit Khurana, who leads our food um, uh, safety and toxins program uh, is heading. And he is the one who is driving this entire research as well as driving um, the outcomes that we would like to see in terms of uh, the pathway moving ahead. His colleague, Rajeshwari Sinha, who is um, the key person who has been doing this research with Amit, and she will also make the presentation today. And then there is Gauri Arora, um, also a very valued colleague at CSC, helping to piece together uh, both the challenges but our effort would be to bring together everyone to look at the solutions. So in the first part of this three-part series, uh, we have three outstanding panelists as well to help us to understand what is the nature of this uh, problem. Their perspectives on both the problem, but also what they see as the solution. In the next part of the series, we want to really discuss an idea that we at CSC have been discussing, which is can antimicrobials become part of a global public good? But we don't know what is a global public good. So we wanted to really understand what does this mean? Uh, what are the opportunities? And then bring together uh, speakers um, and views on the idea of how do we move the needle on uh, development and research and funding for uh, novel anti uh, antibiotics. And the third part, which we hope to do, um, uh, Amit, around October, uh, would be uh, to bring together all the voices, all the learning to really uh, tweak out then what is the roadmap, at least what are the big ideas that are emerging and what is it that we as groups concerned about this need to stand behind and need to ask for and amplify as we move ahead. This is a crisis. We need both uh, to understand the problem, but we need to stand behind solutions. And we need to be able to ask governments to step up um, their game when it comes to something so critical. And that would really be the purpose of the work that we are doing and uh, our efforts um, so that we can uh, work together and bring the entire community together on some of these ways ahead. Um, with that, let me ask Rajeshwari to give the presentation, which is a joint presentation with Amit uh, Gauri, uh, the full team. Rajeshwari will give an overview of what is it that we know, and then I will introduce each panelist and ask them to speak. Rajeshwari. Uh, thank you, Sunita Ji. I'll just quickly share my screen. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone uh, from India. This is Rajeshwari, and I'm working here at the Sustainable Food System Program in CSC. Uh, I'm making this presentation, uh, as Sunita ji said, on behalf of my colleagues. And uh, today, I'm going to, uh, as part of this webinar, I'm going to also talk about our latest uh, story, which was published uh, as a cover in, in the Down to Earth magazine, where we discuss the crisis of antibiotic research and development. So uh, we'll quickly begin. Uh, we'll begin with what uh, Sunita ji left us with, that is a triple jeopardy of, uh, of uh, antibiotic uh, research and development. The first crisis is that antibiotics are becoming more and more ineffective. The burden is huge and rising, uh, around 5 million deaths worldwide associated with antibiotic resistance in 2019 and uh, 1.3 million deaths, around 1.3 million deaths directly attributed uh, to this issue. While existing antibiotics are becoming ineffective, we are losing out on, on our current arsenal of antibiotics, so much so that even critically important ones are losing their power to kill bacteria, uh, and we have to resort to expensive alternative antibiotics uh, to be used. Overall, uh, we are losing out on our treatment options uh, when it comes to treatment of infectious diseases. The second part to it is um, that 
while we are losing out on the effectiveness of antibiotics, what is currently being developed is also not enough. There was an era, 1950s to 1970s, the golden era as it is called, where many new antibiotics were developed. But since 1980s, no new class of antibiotics uh, have been able to enter the market, especially for the gram-negative bacteria. And those that were developed uh, during this period uh, were in inadequate to treat the, the growing resistance, the growing unmet need of resistance, and that too in gram-negative bacteria. Uh, the third crisis, again, is linked to access. Uh, in a study which we uh, uh, referred to in, in our story, we saw that 11 out of 14 countries had access to less than half of the 18 new antibiotics which were launched in the decade of 2010 to 2019. And this is really concerning. And when we looked at these 18 antibiotics, we, we saw that uh, these again lie within the same existing classes, and, and which means that the resistance, the emergence of resistance will be quicker uh, compared to what would have been had it been new class. And only a few of these were designed to uh, tackle the infectious uh, gram negative bacteria. Now, coming to antibiotic development, if we look at the pipeline of antibiotic uh, in, in develop, current development, uh, which we are going to talk in the upcoming slides as well, what is alarming and what is concerning is that the list of candidates targeting the world's priority pathogens has, has remained stagnant, at least from 2017 onwards. The graph alongside that you see show that the numbers have not moved much. It is hovering around the same. And this is something which, uh, which is really bothering because the priority pathogens, as the WHO uh, enlists them, have already been attributed to have become antibiotic resistant and needs to be studied for development of new antibiotics. These are 12 uh, pathogens uh, divided as uh, critical priority, high priority, and medium priority, depending on the kind of infections they cause. For example, in hospitals or, or common diseases or even more common diseases. And WHO in its database of antibacterial products in clinical and preclinical uh, pipeline not only records the antibacterials for these priority pathogens for under development, but it also takes into consideration uh, N tuberculosis, uh, which is TB causing microorganism, and uh, Clostridioides difficile. So when we looked at the WHO database updated until late 2021, what we saw was uh, the global pipeline was indeed weak, and many are also calling it fragile, dry, or even anemic. The numbers that you see on the left uh, represents the overall, uh, uh, overall consortium of antibacterial candidates that we have uh, until late 2021. 297 in all and 217 of them in preclinical development stages, 77 in clinical stages, and three in pre-registration. Of the 77, 45 were traditional uh, antibiotic candidates, meaning that these were small molecules which act by directly targeting the components necessary to restrict bacterial growth or kill the pathogen. There were also 32 non-traditional antibiotic candidates which act by other means, uh, while they can uh, complement the action of these traditional chemical antibiotic molecules, but they cannot necessarily substitute them. And they're often used as adjuvants along with the traditional antibiotic molecules. Of the, of the 45 traditional molecules, there were 28 uh, which targeted the WHO priority pathogens. But what is interesting to observe is this, this uh, basket that we have this, uh, is, is very minuscule. The 77 molecules uh, or candidates in clinical development is very minuscule when it comes to more than 10,000 medicines under active clinical development for cancer more than 1,800 for neuropsychiatric conditions, and around 1,500 for endocrine, blood, and immune disorders. This is, again, data coming from the WHO's Global Health Observatory on Health Research and Development. Now, let us, took, uh, let us take a look at uh, what these numbers mean for us uh, in, the, in the short term and in the long term future. When we look at the near future scenario, which means uh, in the next four to five years, what about those which are in phase three and might or might not see uh, the, the entry into the market? What we see is that the scenario is, is bleak. There are only uh, nine antibiotic, uh, traditional antibiotic candidates uh, in phase three, none for M tuberculosis. And out of these uh, nine, there are only two which will target the critical priority pathogens. What is also interesting to observe here is that most of the developers who are engaged in developing these products are, are small firms. 
yet they have a big task in hand and very few uh, large pharma players are uh, can uh, can be seen to be part of it when it comes to non traditional antibiotic candidates the situation is same it is as bleak uh, there are only five candidates in phase 3 and two in, in the pre registration stage again small players are dominating the development of of these antibiotic candidates what do we have in a long term scenario so for the long term we need to see what is there in the preclinical uh, development pipeline which when clear will enter into the clinical pipeline but when we when we looked at the numbers from the database what we saw was again not very promising only three out of the 217 uh, antibiotic candidates in preclinical pipeline have their in investigative new drug application submitted, which means that they have successfully uh, completed the requirements of preclinical trials and can enter the clinical trials. 31 are in stages of you know, clinical trial application and IND uh, enabling studies. Again, this is too less a pool when we are looking at what we have in the long term, considering that there are several developmental challenges in the preclinical stages. But these numbers, what do they mean and why is this happening? So this is happening because of, of the big exodus that, that big pharmaceutical companies are, are having. Most of them have quit the antibiotic uh, research and development uh, space. And the, and the reason for this is often attributed that this is a high risk and low return proposition. Uh, we'll take a deep dive and spend a couple of moments into, into understanding this. Uh, in, as part of our assessment that we published in, in Down to Earth, we did, a, we did an analysis of the world's 15 big pharmaceutical companies and looked at their uh, clinical pipeline. So when we see this pipeline in detail, research for antibiotic uh, de development clearly comes out to be an abandoned cause. If I can draw your attention to the slide, uh, maybe we can take up one or two examples. For example, AstraZeneca, which is making, uh, in 2022, it made about, about 45 uh, billion US dollars in its revenue and has about 170 molecules currently in its clinical pipeline as on June 2023. What we see is nearly 50% was focused on uh, oncology, but there were none, uh, no other, uh, none, no molecules for, for uh, no antibiotics or no molecules for bacteria, tackling bacteria. Similar is the case with Novartis. Similar is the case with uh, other companies like Crystal Mayer Squibb, Gilead Biosciences, Ellie Lilly, Amgen, uh, Biogen. So these companies are not having molecules for uh, tackling bacterial infections. Many of these have exited earlier, the space like um, Bristol Mayer Squibb and Ellie Lilly. Some have exited recently, for example, Novartis, uh, for example, Johnson & Johnson, they have, they have recently left the, the space. Currently, only four companies are, are developing or engaged in developing antibiotics, which are GSK, uh, Roche, Pfizer, and AbbVie. And there are also a couple of more companies like Johnson & Johnson, Sanofi, and Merck, uh, which are also engaged along with Pfizer and GSK in development of bacterial vaccines. But overall, these companies, the overall revenue made in 2022 was 711 billion US dollars, and 17.5% of which was invested in R&D. So there was, there was a lot of investment pushed into R&D, but the focus was definitely different. But this, this huge table that we saw, what, what does it have to say overall when we looked at all the molecules and clinical pipeline of these 15 companies? What we see is that the pipeline is indeed hollow when it comes to infectious diseases or uh, development of antibiotics. Out of the 1,007 molecules, only 13 are antibacterial candidates, as I said, being developed by four companies. And very interestingly, eight out of these are being made by GSK. This is in, much in contrast to 411 candidates being developed for cancer, 150 for immunology, allergy, inflammation, or respiratory areas, around 84 for cardio cardiology, metabolism, or renal disease areas. But this, is, this, this situation is attributed by the industry often to market failure, and even venture capitalists have moved away because they have found larger lucrative options uh, you know, to fund into. If I, uh, this is a snapshot uh, which shows how the companies, how the major pharma companies have moved out of the antibiotic development space and at the same time made key mergers and acquisitions. Like I said, some have exited earlier, 
uh, like Elilili and BM Squib, Novartis, uh, uh, Sanofi, and JNJ moved out in 2018. And then uh, we also have some companies which have acquired companies in other disease areas. For example, we have AbV, which in 2015 picked up Pharmacyclics, uh, an oncology player. We have uh, Bristol Mayer Squib, which picked up Celgene in 2019, uh, which again focuses on oncology and immunology related areas. And likewise, there are also a couple of companies uh, which are mentioned in this in this departed trail, which have uh, acquired antibiotic players as well. For example, in 2021, Novartis picked up GSK's antibiotic business, um, and then there are small companies also which have announced bankruptcy and that is also placed in this time and so this gives an overall picture of of what has been happening over the past couple of years while it has been attributed to market failure and let us understand what are the parameters we, we mean by market failure one is that antibiotic development takes up a lot of time and a lot of money so while it is a high cost proposition new molecules are definitely getting harder to find and it's a difficult game at the same time, in order to keep them affordable, antibiotics have to be kept inexpensive. And because of the short uh, duration of, of, an, of the antibiotic therapy for, a, for an infection, it sells in lower volumes as compared to chronic conditions like diabetes and hypertension or cancer, which can go on for years. Moreover, once into the market, uh, developers cannot push to sell a new antibiotic. This is because to avoid the emergence of resistance against these uh, products. But we must understand that it is only these first few years which is the best time to recover the cost of development for these companies. By the time when the new antibiotic becomes the first or second line of treatment, many generic options have also developed in parallel and thus there is a risk of losing out on the revenues. The unpredictability due to the sporadic nature of infections and outbreaks is also a concern. A very interesting uh, a number which we wanted to share is that in the US, the annual sales, the total annual sales of 17 out of the 18 new antibiotics launched between 2010 and 2019 was about USD 715 million, which is similar to the sale of just one new oncology product developed during the period. But is this big exodus just because of market or is it just because the market has failed? Uh, it is also because there are profits in other areas. If we take a quick look at the blockbuster drugs, which were uh, sold in 2021 and the money made out of it, we see that it is the same pharma, uh, big pharma players who have made quite a lot of uh, sales revenue out of blockbuster drugs in different areas like cancer, autoimmune disorders, and rare diseases. As part of the AMR Action Fund, some big companies have also committed a few hundred million dollars collectively spread over the next several years for antibiotic development. But the question remains whether the big pharma or the major pharma can be absolved of the responsibility of developing antibiotics, especially when it is earning so handsomely through a few drugs. How can we leave out the small and the medium players? Obviously, they have been making a space that is being left vacant by the, by the large companies. Around 80% of the new antibiotic discoveries uh, are currently attributed to small companies being developing them. But it has also not been easy for these companies. They are struggling not only to develop, but also to make money from what they have already developed in terms of antibiotics. We have a data point which says that out of the 12 antibiotic companies which went public in the last decade, only five are still active, while the remaining have either filed for bankruptcy or have faced diminished values or they have cut down on their staff. So in some way or the other, they have been impacted. We have put some examples here as well. While these pharmaceutical companies uh, collapsed, it took out of circulation five out of the 15 antibiotics that the US FDA had approved since 2010. But some companies are also thinking differently and diversifying in order to you know, manage their potential risk that they can have. For example, Bugworks Research, which was uh, initially focused on antibiotic development, has also started in parallel to develop drugs for oncology. What can be done to aid the small and medium companies that have entered antibiotic research? What is very agreeable is that it is there is a need to support research and market through innovation, uh, through investments, uh, which are broadly categorized as push and pull incentives. 
while the push incentives support the early funding, early stage of antibiotic development through direct support like grants, loans, or tax incentives. They are, uh, the good thing about it is that the funders, which are mostly nonprofits, industry, and government, they share the risk of the failure that comes along with the process. And they can also help, down the, help bring down the development costs. Some examples of push funders are Carbex, uh, representative from which we have today. And then there's GARP and AMR Action Fund. And pool incentives, on the other hand, provide a known return on investment and help bring a developed antibiotic molecule in the market. Largely driven by governments, uh, they do not address the risk of failure that comes in stages of development. Currently being considered by uh, some, some countries, what, is, what, is what we should mention here is that the UK and the Sweden have recently, 2020, launched pilots of the subscription model, a fully delinked and a partially delinked subscription model, respectively. The UK, in fact, is even considering expansion of this model. Uh, recently, there was a news around this. But, what, but overall, what we see is that push incentives have been there for a decade. But it is clear that their success has been less than required and they need more support and need to be supplemented. On the other hand, the pool incentives have been more recent and their impact remains to be seen. So we call for critical reforms. These critical reforms are needed to stimulate the antibiotic innovation system in order to ensure an equitable and sustainable antibiotic access globally. These reforms can include greater public financing, such as those related to market reimbursements, uh, easing out of regulatory approvals, cost of new antibiotics and clinical trials. And here individual governments and policymakers have to play a role. We also think other governments, um, multiple governments need to come together and develop a coordinated response when it comes to prioritizing antibiotics and developers, testing and piloting incentives, removing access barriers. Unless major economies come together, this is going to be a difficult task with limited long-term gains. There is also a need to strike the right balance in the public-private partnership aimed at antibiotic development. And we must also not forget the role of countries like India, which have big antibiotic generics industry that is able to provide access to cheaper antibiotics across, across borders. This is my last slide, and I want to leave it with a, with a line of thought and the discussions to be taken forward, is that it is definitely time that we start thinking about antibiotics as a global public good, like Sunita ji said. By definition, public goods are non-excludable, meaning they have to be made available to all, and non-rivalrous, meaning that they can be enjoyed over and over again by anyone without diminishing the benefits they deliver to others. And they can be local, national, or global. While antibiotics may not fit this strictest definition of a global public good, but given the benefit that they bring to the society, it definitely makes them as close a global public good as one can be. We must also remember that the markets cannot be expected to optimally supply public goods because there are incentives lacking for private players. And this is where the intervention of governments is needed as far as the scale of coordination, the power to enforce regulations, and uh, managing distribution challenges is concerned. So I will leave it at that and, and uh, give it uh, back to Sunita ji for taking forward discussions. Thank you. On mute. Sorry, I was on mute. So um, thank you, Rajeshwari. Thank you for the presentation. And thank you so much for the work that you have done to bring together all the different strands of information. And we will, as I said, um, hope to take this forward. I now would like to call upon James, James Anderson. James is the executive director of the International Federation of Pharma Manufacturers and Association, which is such an important body. And um, I have, we've had a long association with James and someone who's a very thoughtful person looking at the issues of the pharma industry, the, the challenges, and also being able to help us to see what is the nature of the crisis in industry and how is industry looking at the way ahead. Uh, James, please. 
Thanks very much, Sunita and colleagues. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I must congratulate on, on the article and, and that presentation, which was very comprehensive and, and, and very clear, bringing together a lot of the data that's uh, fragmented out there in a, in a very clear way. So really congratulations on that. That's a lot of work and I think it tells the story very well. And the industry that I represent, which are mostly the big pharmaceutical companies, would, would agree with pretty much with the story that, that uh, was told. And so I, 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 I won't kind of repeat um, a lot of it, but I want to pick up on, on a couple of things, first of all. So, you know, one, uh, what, do, what do we believe is the way forward? Secondly, what is it that industry is doing to, to contribute? Uh, and then thirdly, when we look ahead at the, um, the political um, milestones coming up, you know, what is it that we hope to see from, from, from the governments uh, of the world? And, and because it is the world, this is, a, this is truly a global issue in a similar way to other infectious disease ep epidemics and pandemics, we can't predict where they will come first and where they will go. But we do know there's a, a strong likelihood that they can be spread all around the world and cause problems to patients. So first of all, in terms of uh, the solutions, uh, uh, as the presenter said, really, you could say this is a market failure, or you could say the market is working, but the result is a failure. What do I mean? The market for pharmaceuticals should describe the value that the buyer of, of, uh, of pharmaceuticals places on the different types of, of medicines. That value then, in a, in a market way, uh, uh, directs or, or encourages, let's say, attracts investment into R&D for the future generations of medicines. That's, how the, that's the market, that's how the market works. Now, the problem we have for antibiotics is that that market dynamic has meant that companies are not investing much or not, not investing enough into uh, antibiotics, into new antibiotics and other antimicrobials. But we would argue that the, the, you know, the way to solve that is to improve the market conditions through the use of incentives. And I, again, liked the way that that was presented. We would say you need both the push incentives, which do de-risk the early uh, stage research. And uh, Rich and, and Leslie will no doubt go into that a bit more there. So I won't, I won't go in detail, but that's super super valuable for the R&D ecosystem. On the other hand, it's still, it's not sufficient because again, as, as was presented, the small companies that have successfully brought a new antibiotic to, to the market in recent years have still gone bankrupt, which means that you, that's why you need the pull incentives as well. And we are seeing, as you said, some progress. Uh, we're seeing, um, the, the UK pilot, which, which I can go in more detail if, if you want later, but uh, that's the most concrete implementation and really moving in the right direction. We think other countries should look at that and find a way to do something similar. In the US, there's a serious discussion about it. It's called the Pasteur Act, uh, and, it, and it, is, it is a similar proposal. It's uh, tabled into the Congress right now, and really we should be hoping that it's passed but we recognize the political challenges there. And also in Europe, there is a, there is a proposal from the European Commission, which would make a very significant difference as well. Japan and Canada are discussing. So there's some progress. Now, what is it that industry is doing? It was mentioned, but we uh, did bring together over 20 of the largest pharmaceutical companies to set up the AMR Action Fund. This was because those companies, not all of them are even involved in antibiotics, but they recognize that, that we need to support the small companies and make sure the pipeline does keep moving forward until those pull incentives are in place, because otherwise we risk losing even more. And so uh, these companies 
came together to set up a new fund with about a billion dollars, uh, as was stated. It's already made five investments into truly innovative science and early stage products to enable those companies to move them through. So that's been that's a very unusual, I would say, unique uh, way of working for any 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 private industry, really. But to have 20 competitors come together because they recognize that the world needs this, this, this progress to be made in antibiotics, you know, is is quite unprecedented. And finally, um, from my opening remarks, Sinita, when when I look at the work that the Global Leaders Group, uh, uh, you know, is doing, it's it's really important because th this is a global pro problem. Therefore, we do need joined up global solutions. And next year, as you know very well, we have a great opportunity, which is that the United Nations General Assembly has a special meeting for the heads of heads of government on antimicrobial resistance. This is the second time that's happening. The first one uh, was eight years ago in 2016, and I was lucky enough to be there. It uh, really moved the needle in terms of the awareness, both at, among governments and among heads of state, but also on the public. And since then, we've seen you know, a real step change in the progress that has been made, albeit with still a long way to go. So what I hope to see in that meeting is uh, ambition, you know, a clear understanding of the problem, first of all, uh, or reiteration, a, a sense of the fact we have made progress in the last eight years, but that there's a lot, a lot more we still need to do and the commitment from the governments to actually drive that forward and, and make it happen. So let me uh, let me pause there, Sunita, and and um, um, but thanks for the opportunity to to make some remarks. Happy to come back if you have more questions. Yes, thank you, Rich, uh, James. In fact, I will come back. I um, the way uh, Rajeshwari Amit and Body have organized this is that I will do this first set and then come back to each one of you and sort of go go in a little more deeper into some of the issues that you have raised. So let me now uh, bring in Richard Lawson. Richard Lawson is uh, the senior project manager at Carbex. And uh, you heard Rajeshwari talking about Carbex, a very important global initiative to, to really help us to uh, push for both research and for um, new uh, drugs to come on. Um, fascinating work that is happening at Carbex. So we look forward to hearing from you, Richard, in terms of your perspective of the problem. And uh, then in the next round, I will come back to the solutions. Richard. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be part of this panel. and. Thank you for organizing it. I think it's a great opportunity to raise awareness and share information about where we are and where we may go. So thanks again, this is great. Um, I'm gonna be focusing really on CARBEX and the, the push incentive side of things. Um, th there are other push uh, organizations that are involved in supporting AMR, but I'm gonna describe what we're doing in Carbex. And I think it's important really to highlight that although there are challenges and there are some limitations to push incentives, I think it's really important to start with the recognition that they're also working. We are making progress and there is some hope for the future because of the co concerted effort of multiple governments and multiple foundations. And again, I think that's a really important message. Carbex is a global organization. We provide funding for the best science wherever it's found in the world. We have funding, as I said, from multiple governments. Uh, it started with the United States government, um, the German government, and the UK government have also provided funding. Uh, the Wellcome Trust was an early funder, one of the first uh, founding funders of Carbex, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have also provided funding to us. So we're very grateful for that. The funding from those organizations has really enabled us to do everything that we're able to do. And we, we provide non-dilutive funding to small, mainly small companies. The vast majority 
of companies that we provide funding to have fewer than 50 employees, some fewer than 10 employees. So these are small, innovative organizations. And this is in the stage going from basic research, which is usually funded by governments within their country. Um, we bridge that space, basic research, through what we call the valley of death, where the risks to new products are the greatest and where the failure rate, unfortunately, is the highest. We take those, support those companies through phase one clinical trials and get them prepared for later stage clinical trials where other organizations like the AMR Action Fund and like CARD-P and, and BARDA and other funding agencies can then provide later funding for them. So we, for therapeutics, we, we support therapeutics, diagnostic and preventatives uh, like vaccines. And for therapeutics and vaccines, we support the the stages, again, after basic research, uh, areas like hit the lead, lead optimization, preclinical, IND enabling, and as I said, phase one clinical trials. Carbex, I still think of as a fairly new organization. We we started in 2016. We made our first awards in 2017. And since then, we've issued a total of 92 awards to a range of companies, as I said, mostly very small companies. And that's totaled up to roughly $400 million that we've provided so far. And what that's done, um, we the presentation was really helpful in highlighting how thin the global pipeline is. But what we're doing is rejuvenating that pipeline and bringing products into that so they can move toward clinical development and give people who are in early basic research a path forward. And, and this is really key that there are links in the chain. There's a, a process that needs to flow from basic research through this translational science, late stage clinical development, and then commercialization and onto the market. And if any part of that is disrupted or not sufficiently funded, then that impacts what comes out at the end. And as we can see through the presentation and through your report, there just is not enough in the pipeline to meet the global demand that we have uh, around the world. And so the main challenge to these push incentives like Carbax and some of the others, and even the AMR Action Fund and GARP, the main limitation is that these alone cannot do the job. As James said, push incentives and pull incentives need to work together. The, one of the greatest risks that we have is that Carbax and other organizations will advance these projects right up to a cliff where there is nowhere else for them to go, no downstream funding for them to work toward. And so that, um, that's really the greatest challenge. We do need some forms of market reform. Um, Carbex as an organization is saying agnostic in terms of what that looks like, but um, there is great promise as, as James and others have said, and within the presentation, uh, we've seen more activity in the last several years than there had ever been before. Uh, the G7 government and more interest from the G20. Um, again, it is a global problem and it will take a global solution to these market reforms on the pull side. But thank you again. I'm really pleased to be part of this panel and looking forward to more discussion. Thank you, Rich. And uh, now if I could ask Leslie, uh, Leslie Olivier is the uh, Director of uh, Secretariat of the Global AMR and R&D Hub. And this is a global partnership which is focused on uh, improving coordination in AMR research and development using the One Health approach. So Leslie, if you could bring into this both what you heard from Rajeshwari, James, as well as Richard. How do you see this emerging um, and uh, your perspectives on the problem? Thank you very much, Sunita, and it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I echo my fellow panelists' sentiments. Uh, congratulations on the excellent report you published recently. It really does bring together all the different strands of the, the problem that we're facing. Um, 
I think, you know, we all know that resources for research and development are limited, and that is that is a, a major problem. And then, so we need to make sure that the activities are actually coordinated and prioritised. As part of the work that we're doing at the Global AMR R&D Hub, where we're, we're actually focusing on cooperation and collaboration in R&D. And what we do to help us do that is uh, use the information that we've collected in our dynamic dashboard, and that presents information on what's been funded in AMR R&D at the moment. So it's on usually for public and philanthropic sources, not private sources. That's that's James's, James's area there. And this is funding since 2017. And when you can look at this information, you as a collective, it can really help to guide priority setting and evidence-based decision-making for countries and funders worldwide. So identifying those, those gaps, you know, we all know that the, the pipeline is weak and we need to know where to put our funding into and how to, how to do that. So what we see, I think Richard said this already, we are making progress. Uh, we have around 13,000 AMR research projects in our database, and this is worth 11.2 billion US dollars. So money is going into AMR R&D, um, but where are, where are the gaps? What do we need to do? We've got 1.8 to 2 billion US dollars every year going into AMR R&D general, in general from the public and philanthropic uh, sector globally. And just under a quarter of this, so 23% goes into the development of new antibiotics, antibacterials and other therapeutics each year. And not surprisingly, the majority of this investment is focused on human health. So over 95% of what we have in our dashboard uh, is going towards uh, human health for therapeutics. So progress is being made. Governments are continuing to invest in relevant partnerships and initiatives, you know, things like uh, CARB-X and GARD-P. And these are the initiatives that are crucial to creating a healthy pipeline. As James mentioned, the AMR Action Fund on the private investment side, uh, they're really working towards their goal of bringing two to four new antibiotics to patients by by 2030, and they're expanding their portfolio, covering both traditional and non-traditional therapies. But despite this progress and willingness, uh, we, we still have this fragmented pipeline. And what we're, what we're really lacking is the predictability that would encourage the development of a more sustainable and healthy pipeline of the antibiotics and antibacterials that we really need. And that, this is to save lives. This is not, this is not trivial. A trivial matter. So we really need to build more robustness and resilience into the funding of the development pi pipeline. So if we take one of those funders or actors out of that pipeline, what happens? You know, the, the chain breaks. And this is an ex extremely acute issue for small uh, biotech companies and research groups. And these are the ones that are often developing the most promising preclinical antibacterial R&D projects that are feeding this, this pipeline, this clinical pipeline, which is already, already weak. And so what we're seeing you know, as a whole is investment in R&D at the current scale and in isolation. And money isn't, just, money isn't enough. It, this isn't enough to drive the development of new antibacterials beyond the, the R&D phase. We need the development and implementation mechanisms of actually implementing these pool incentives or other innovative financing mechanisms to ensure we have a robust and sustainable R&D ecosystem that encourages innovation that can really address the ongoing emergence of resistance. I'll stop there, Sunita. Um, I, th I think we're running out of time anyway. So. No, we have time. So, yeah. and these are very fascinating uh, discussions. Uh, Amit, before I start the next round, is there anything you want to add to this discussion from what you have heard? Amit? Well, I think uh, uh, I think it's good to note that the stakeholders are are basically giving a sense that there is a, a there is a progress and that needs to be recognized. But having said that, a lot needs to be done. And I particularly like the I mean think that the the idea of predictability and the idea of uh, coordinations coordination uh, to avoid a fragmented response, let's say, is very critical. No, very good point. So let me take further, in fact, Amit, what you have raised uh, with James a little more. So James, um, I think what Amit has also said is um, really bang on. And 
again, um, given the state and the, the you know, the, 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 the vastness of the challenge, I think for all of us, we're looking at all the different approaches that can work. I don't think anyone is saying only one or the other. But from my, but the question that always comes to mind is, uh, and I will come back to Richard on, you know, how he sees that the uh, uh, push incentives can be improved. But when we're looking at the pull incentives, the question, James, that gets raised is number one: um, pharma industry is really, and, and we have, I, I, you know, I'm sorry, we really stress that point. Um, you know, about the profits of pharma industry and huge profits that pharma industry is making today. Uh, why should industry be further incentivized? Should there not be some ways in which those profits are further used for what is a human um, challenge? And, you know, how does the industry look at this? Because there is, I mean, and, and, and I'm also raising this because we're at a time in the world when there is a lot of outrage about some of these crises and the fact that we are not stepping up enough to deal with it. So how does industry look at this context of, you know, a, a, a public perception that here is, and we have data and the data is out there, huge profits, investment in drugs that make money. And here is a, a, a challenge, a drug which cannot be overused. And therefore it's a self limiting um, um, issue. Uh, for an industry because we know that yet it's something that is so critical for humankind. So that was one question that I had. And the second is um, the third part of the triple jeopardy uh, is access. And therefore, how do you see the uh, pool incentives working for um, access? So those were my two issues for you. Great, thanks, Anita. So um, so really good questions, first of all. I think, it, so how, how to start? I, th I think that they are, they should be viewed together, right? So most of the new antibiotics that are being invested, uh, investigated are, should and are targeting those critical pathogens that, that Rajaswari presented. Those are the those are the bacteria that the experts, uh, uh, you know, in the world, the WHO think are the, the highest risk uh, um, of of developing worse resistance. So that part is that's a good start. Right. And, and, and again, the investments of Carbex and, and others help attract more more effort in those areas. Now, the the antibiotics against those pathogens as you said are should be used at very very small quantities because luckily still there aren't many patients that have those really nasty resistance there's they they number in the thousands or maybe tens of thousands you know uh not in in the millions let's say and what that means is that they they then they certainly are in the the reserve categorization of the who structure. So the WHO uh, uh, categorizes all antibiotics into either access, which means they are, they, they're widely used, they should be first line, often for the big patient populations, or, or reserve is the third category, where really they are held back until the last, those, those very uh, sick patients with high, high levels of resistance. And in the middle, there's what they call the watch, which is where they are kind of used on a second line basis, and in specific circumstances where the first line ones don't work. So for every new antibiotic, pretty much, it should be in the kept in the reserve category. That means when you think about, so then when you think about the, 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 um, the, the economic challenge, right? The market challenge, that's why we, we think the, 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 what the UK model is doing, which sets a fixed, level of payment to the company and that uh, is is al allows access to however much of that antibiotic is needed right so it doesn't it, it it's it's a it is a subscription in the same way that when you subscribe to netflix for example you pay the same every month and some months you might watch a whole you know a whole series on one weekend if it's raining 
but then in another another month you actually may not watch anything because there's your you know it's the summer and you're outside so it's a bit the same as that that's in that in some cases and you can't really predict in some of those new antibiotics you may need to use quite a lot still not high but but quite a lot or you may need to not use very much so that's why the subscription model gives predictability to both to the payers and to the companies but it also in my opinion can enable uh access much more broadly because it once once the company has that level of predictability there's a much greater openness to include uh in that same model access in lower income countries as long as long and this is the crucial bit as long as in those other countries the product will also be used very carefully just for those patients that that really need it in the same way so when that so so that's how i see those two parts of the question linking together for the innovative antibiotics there is a there's a whole nother topic of 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 the access antibiotics which are the older ones where there's um there's there's higher volumes that are needed rightly so but almost all of those are off patent so they're made by multiple manufacturers and the challenges there are quite different in terms of um, lack of availability. It's usually due to a, a supply shortage. Uh, price should not be a barrier in those in those products, right? Because there's multiple suppliers. Um, th there's no there's no technical barriers there. They're not they're not the most straightforward medicines to make because uh, uh, quite a lot of them are made through fermentation and other manufacturing techniques but there um there are no there are there, there aren't you know those are well understood uh um and and there are many companies that are able to make those so this there are very if we look at the access uh category any lack of availability you know should not be to do with price should not be to do with manufacturing should not be to do with distribution. We do still need to make sure there's a level of control over how they're used, but even there for access, it's considered less of a priority, I would say. So hopefully that that covers both of your questions in a in a joined up way. No, interesting. I think this is something we want to take forward as a conversation. So we would like to uh, discuss this uh, in greater detail. So thank you for being so frank about it. Um, Rich, if I may now turn to you on um, really how in your view, because you know, Carbex really has done an amazing work and it's good to hear the good news story in terms of things are happening. Uh, but you know, it's, it, what I found was that you have this huge numbers and then you, they literally, like you said, they fall off the cliff. So how, how, what do you see um, really working in terms of, as you said, the push and the pull coming together? Um, how would you conceptualize uh, the, the push and the pull coming together? And in your view, how does the pull become much more effective uh, from the point of view, particularly smaller companies, smaller research organizations, which are doing the bulk of the work? And my added question to that, Rich, is that given the fact that a lot of these companies are doing public funded research, um, how do you maximize the benefit uh, for public as the drug goes also on the market? This is not mm -hmm. private research in that sense. So how do you keep that, um, that going, um, mm. Rick? Yeah, thank you. Those, those are all good questions. Um, and I'll, I'll try to address them all, but if I miss one, please uh, remind me at the end to be sure that we catch it all. And uh, I, I agree, first of all, in terms of making the push incentives more effective, Leslie made the point earlier that money alone is not the solution. I totally agree with that, but more money sure does help. And we, we simply don't have enough on the push incentive side. I think Leslie made that point as well. Uh, and with CarbX, one thing that's been really gratifying to see is that as we have 
additional funding rounds and we announced a call for new types of products in, in particular areas aligned with priority pathogens. We continue to see new product developers applying to us. It's not just the same old faces, it's not the same old names and companies, but there's new work coming up. And I think it's another indication of success in rejuvenating the pipeline and rejuvenating the talent pool because people realize that there is some money here, enough money to do this innovative research. So that's very encouraging. Um, and, and naturally, I would say that we do need more money for uh, push incentives. I think the, the information that the global AMR R&D hub is pulling together will be really valuable in doing an objective analysis of the most efficient ways to invest that money. Where is there the greatest gap? Where would an investment make the greatest return on that investment? So I think that's all really encouraging. Um, and we certainly value the data from the global AMR R&D hub. But, but again, more money alone is not going to solve the problem. I think the point about coordination and collaboration is really key as well. And I, I was so pleased to see an announcement just earlier today about Bugworks uh, forming a relationship with Guard P for downstream development of one of the products that we have supported for a long time. So that is, I think, a real success story where the project had been funded by Carbex for a number of years now. They started in lead optimization with Carbex. And as you said, with these smaller companies, we do provide more than just money. We work very closely with the product developers. As you said, small companies can't possibly have all the skills and the capabilities and the expertise that they need to do everything within their company. They, they can't afford access to all the experts with all the experience. And that's a key part of what Carbex also provides in addition to the money. So we've worked closely with all of the companies, including Bugworks, to help them advance their product and also to prepare for the next step. Where is the next stage of funding going to come from? And how can you be best prepared to make that case for the next stage of development and the next stage of funding? So again, I see that as a, a great success story. And then another element of uh, translating the public investment into these companies into greater value for the public, I think comes around to equity uh, globally. And I'm really impressed by the work that Welcome has started to lead uh, very recently about global equity in R&D for infectious diseases in particular. And I think it's putting a spotlight on an area that's very important for access and affordability and, and even more areas. Uh, Carbex, as many of you may know, does include a provision in every single contract that we've written. Every one of the 92 awards includes a very specific provision around stewardship and access. And this again comes to coordination where we work very closely with the, the funders to Carbex, but also with industry to ensure that what we were going to put forward would be realistic and achievable and that the companies would be able to survive from a, a financial point of view with the stewardship and access obligations that they have from Carbex. And it stays with the product through its life cycle, whether it's acquired or licensed and so forth. And so this then is kind of a pathway to agreements similar to what, this was not a direct Carbex involvement, but the agreement between Shionogi and the um, Guard P in terms of making that product available in places in the world where Shionogi was not planning to market Cifidrocol. And so that's a real win in that uh, providing access, even when it's not in the financial interest of Shionogi, they're still enabling that through Guard P. So there are positive examples. There's certainly more work to be done to make this more effective, to improve the coordination, to improve the collaboration. But the good thing here is that most people here are mission driven and they recognize the importance for global public health and are motivated in the right direction. And so that really supports 
collaboration and coordination. But uh, again, looking forward to more of this discussion. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Leslie, if I could now take this forward with you, I mean, the point that you made about, you know, money is not enough. And the point that I was also asking Richard is really uh, the huge, it's not huge, it's very small still, and we need to increase the public investment uh, in the research and in the R&D, which, uh, I mean, the fascinating data that shows that most of this research um, in uh, uh, novel antibiotics is happening in very small companies and universities, uh, publicly funded um, um, uh, through CARVEX and through um, other public funds. So the question that is still there is what, how do you take this pipeline forward of public, I mean, public supported research to public supported further development? And then how do you make sure that if it is publicly supported, how does it look different from a private supported uh, research? Because that's where the context, the, the concept of a global public good comes in, where you say that here is something where governments have already invested. And uh, now it needs to be maximized for the benefit of very large numbers of people. Um, so how do you see that uh, conversation and what do you see as some of the ideas that are coming up that will help us to move this forward? Thanks, Anita. Yeah, I think communication is key here. I think, you know, that it solves a lot of the, the issues that we, we want to want to solve in the in this in this area. And this is where the hub kind of can come in. Uh, we have 17 countries on our board. We have the European Commission and other, uh, we have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust and other observers from the, the tripartite and Africa CDC. So we, we're working together. They're all public funders, philanthropic funders coming together to have a, a global conversation. And I think that's where it starts, you know, to try and get coordination and agreement, maybe not always agreement across all countries, but in regional or, you know, groups of different countries or different actors to working together to align on specific mechanisms to move forward across and pooling, pooling the, the R&D through the pipeline and creating the products that we need to mitigate the impacts of EMR. And as part of our aim to enhance co cooperation and collaboration on this specific subject, we've actually established a pool incentives working group or a market incentives working group where we kind of look at, you know, how can we, there's a lots of motivation, there's lots of interest in doing something to solve these problems, but how do, what are the mechanisms of this? What are the mechanisms of implementing these types of incentives and how do we go, go forward with this? And this is what this, this group is actually talking about. And we actually uh, opened this up to our stakeholders as well quite recently to have a joint meeting where we could sort of broaden that conversation and get a wider range of perspectives from industry, academia, funders, and also civil society, and just have that frank and open conversation. What needs to be done to incentivize the development on, and access to new antimicrobials, antibiotics, of course, at the center of that. And, you know, this, this is a really, a fantastic exchange of of different perspectives and an open dialogue which i don't think happens happens enough and what our stakeholders were telling us and, and this includes smes industry academia and funders and and they let us know that it's important to create an incentive with a meaningful size and duration and that any incentive model that that, that are implemented across different countries really needs to be delinked from revenue to ensure appropriate use of course you know we need we need to make sure that happens and they also suggested that uh, coordinated efforts and priorities globally would really help to support developer predictability. So it's about an exchange of needs and wants from, from all the different actors involved. There's also a general agreement from our stakeholders that there's really a, a, a need for realistic, realistic and collective uh, AMR R&D targets for new antibiotics and antibacterials. And these should very much be informed by public health needs. Um, as part of that, there really needs to be a, a normative process to identify how many or what kind of 
you know, high impact uh, antibiotics that we'll actually be needing to develop over a, a certain specific timeline, whether that's a decade. We know it takes a long time to do this, but we need you know, developers need some some you know framework. Governments need some frameworks to say this is how much money we're putting in. This is how this is what we need to get out to address those critical public health needs. And yeah, so that was a, a way for both developers and governments and funders to agree on R&D priorities and design the appropriate incentives that will really uh, attract the required investment to secure the sustainable uh, pipeline that we need of innovative drugs. In tandem, um, we've been working with the G7. Uh, they requested the, the hub and WHO to uh, publish a progress report in terms of what activities um, countries have been doing. Um, to incentivize the development of antibacterials. And, uh, and we, what we're doing is actually using that information to come up with some recommendations to countries as well. And it echoes very much uh, with the, the, the presentation that, you know, that we've just seen in terms of the, the critical points that you've, you've mentioned. And we really need to see alignment and targeted action on financing mechanisms across both the push and pull spectrum. And we're hearing that a lot, and we just need the mechanisms to know how to do this. And the working group is one, one way forward of um, allowing this global conversation to happen. On the push side, of course, as I mentioned before, we need more sustainable and predictable financing and, and resources. Uh, and this includes further financing of public private partnerships. We can't just rely on one, one uh, initiative to do everything. We need to have some resilience and, and some redundancy there. On the pool side, we need to build on the experience of, of countries. You know, as James mentioned, the UK, Sweden, uh, America, they're having, you know, they've, they're implementing incentives, they're trialing different, different ways forward. And we need to sort of explore the possibility, learn lessons, share the challenges, and explore the possibility of formulating international collaborative mechanisms on these types of incentives. Um, it's clear that antibiotic development and access crisis will not be solved without cooperation between countries and stakeholders. And this needs to be an open and frank dialogue with a bit of homework involved from all involved. I'll stop there, Sunita. No, very good points, Leslie. I mean, our concern really has been that you know, is this good enough? And you're right, uh, there is time, we need to maximize what we have on the table. Mm. But the question is that, is this really good enough in terms of the scale of the challenge that we have in front of us? And what more can be done uh, to really take this forward because uh, of the peculiar nature of the antimicrobial um, resistance problem and of course the access problem. And that combined puts it in a different category to any other drug that we are dealing with, an oncology drug or a diabetes drug. There's a difference between them and antibiotics, which is why we need a different approach for it. And that's really where um, um, we are still looking at um, uh, what are those options? Uh, Rajeshwari Amit, you want to add to anything that you have heard? I have a few questions that I will then draw upon. And, um, uh, uh, but please go ahead, um, Amit. Um, well, I think it's a very, very interesting discussion. That, I mean, the points that we are hearing are uh, adding a lot to our understanding as well as I'm sure of viewers' understanding. A couple of very quick points, I mean, I may just, uh, I can just add one, of course, is yes. Uh, have we reached to a situation where we are saying, okay, these five antibiotics are required, and these 50 companies are, are shortlisted uh, for these five antibiotics, uh, which are in different stages in each company, and this is the overall money that needs to go, and, and this money will come from here, and this money will come from there. So it's a very broad, simplistic uh, kind of uh, understanding, I think. I would just, I'm just curious, have we reached to that stage or that stage is quite far from now? That's one question in my mind. The other, of course, is James did mention about UK subscription model. So it's very clear it would just not be about one nation. I mean, I, I as far as I understand, the pull incentive from a particular government is about, is linked to the share of antibiotic use. 
And UK, for example, I think is uh, talked about this. Uh, I mean, fix the value based on two to three percent of their share. Uh, the question is, if UK does it and others do not, very soon it will have very limited gains. So therefore, it's very important that national governments, all of them have to, at least the major economies of the world have to get, have to coordinate. That to me is very, very, very critical because it will come back. The, it'll, it'll hit the access part, it'll hit the stewardship part, it'll hit the resistance part. So that's that to me is, a it, to me in that context, the problem is global, but the response has to be global. And that's very important uh, in my view. Maybe that question about the UK subscription model, because that's clearly something that we need to discuss further. And the point that Amit has made, James, would you like to take that uh, further and to respond to it as well? Well, I, I, I just, I 100% agree with what you say, Amit. The, the, the UK is kind of blazing a trail. This is a new way of purchasing any medicine, uh, pretty much hasn't been done before. And it's a very specific solution for the, for the problem of antibiotics. Maybe, given... maybe if you and Amit, because you know, we have a lot of people who are listening in, yeah. give us a very quick, I mean, the subscription model very much is called like the Netflix model, but tell us, a few words about it so that everyone understands is on is on track on it. Yeah, sure. So, so, so the this was introduced a couple of years ago in the UK as a pilot, and the idea is that there's a, a negotiation based on the value of the antibiotic to society in the UK, not just to the individual that receives the treatment. So that's one part that's different. Then that value enables the the discussion of the the annual payment the subscription payment that the UK, the NHS pays to the company. And that's a fixed payment for a number of years into the future, initially three, but extendable up to 10 or even longer. And so, as I said before, really, that that gives a, a very clear value to the product that's different than any other type of product that, you know, that's not how the NHS buys anything else. And that's right. It also gives predictability of the revenue in, in the future to the company and to the NHS. So we do see that that really helping to uh, solve quite a lot of the challenges here. Now, as Amit says, that will only work. You know, R and D is done globally. This problem is a global problem, and so it will only work if other countries do something similar. Not all other countries have the same structure as the UK. They don't all have an NHS or a single, you know, public system, which means that, you know, each country needs to adapt the model a bit so that it does fit with their with their structure. But that's what you see in the US. The Pasteur Act I mentioned is uh, uh, is similar in in along those dimensions. It is an annual fixed payment. Uh, and it is therefore, you know, like a subscription. Um, and really, the, Europe is going in a different direction, but that can also, you know, that can also work if it fits with the European system. We are hopeful that other, certainly the G7 countries will also launch that, uh, something similar. Um, I Can I touch on the other point that Amit made around sort of... Yes sort of trying to manage the pipeline better. I think there is a need to do some of that, but R&D is inherently unpredictable. You, you can never, you never know. I mean, I wish we did, right? I wish we knew that when we started the development of a medicine that it was gonna make it and be amazing, but that's not, that's not how science works. So that means, it, you can't you can't you have to be careful about trying to manage it to to you can't control it right but what what you can do and i think this this would be interesting maybe to hear from the others as well when you look at the pipeline there are some priority pathogens four of them in fact that are high priority where there's really nothing in the pipeline it's it's really empty some of the other pathogens have you know 10 or 20 uh products in development so you could say maybe that's 
close. But the, so in other words, there's a big variability. What, what we're not seeing at all is a collaborative effort to say, right, we've got a big gap here. How do we, how do we stimulate some new work in this area? which means in universities, it means in small companies, it means academic health institutions and, and then big companies as well. So that when, we, when Amit talked about collaboration, I think there, there, there's an opportunity still to do that, it needs to be done in a targeted way and needs to be not trying to, not trying to take over the whole market, but to, be, be very targeted fill in these gaps but i'd be interested what what the others say on that one as well richard leslie what would you like to add to that point richard yeah i, I first of all going to the, the most recent point about uh, organizing the pipeline and coordinating the pipeline i totally agree with what james said um, in most of our discussion today we focused on the financial challenges the economic challenges but there are very real and very challenging scientific challenges as well. And that does lead to that inherent risk. There's just no way to know which products are gonna make it all the way to the market and even survive on the market from a scientific point of view. There's an unfortunate history of some vaccines, especially gram positive vaccines that look very promising in clinical trials, but just do not make it for one reason or another. So we can't, pick the five companies that are gonna be the winners. There's just no way to pick winners. But I also totally agree with the idea of being very clear and very transparent about the priorities based on the priority pathogens and the syndromes, the disease profiles that are clear. We don't have good enough data about the burden of disease. That would be a great area to improve, to make that sort of prioritization more effective. But uh, that is definitely something that Carbex is committed to doing, to coordinate the priorities that we develop. In fact, we're about to start our portfolio strategy refresh, and we will be coordinating with groups that are earlier than us in terms of development and downstream of us to be very open. These are the priorities that we see. This is why we see them as priorities based on the pathogens and based on burden of disease. Um, going back to the models uh, for push and pull, I think on the pull incentive side, it is clearly a global challenge and th there needs to be global participation. It's great to see the UK model transitioning from a pilot into a full program. So the, they have clearly uh, recognized the benefits of that approach. And I think what James said too about the fact that there can be some diversity in fact, there may need to be diversity in terms of what those models look like so that it actually works in the local companies or countries rather. The key is that they're doing something and that they recognize their fair share and they come up with a model that um, supports their fair share. Very interesting, Richard. Leslie? Thank you. Yes, you know, I'm just going to echo the sentiments of Richard and, and James. I think. Um, there's a lot, lot being done. There's a lot of progress made, and in, uh, there's a lot of unpredictability in in the pipeline, and we have to be cognizant of that. Of course, uh, there has to be a bit, bit more of recognition that it's not just about the individual pathogens, but it's also about syndromes as well. And how do we meet in the middle there? How do we sort of prioritise based on these these different aspects? I was actually having a look at our data and our dashboard this morning in terms of what um, investments go into priority pathogens for development of new thera therapeutics for human health. And we see that um, a lot of the funding actually goes into um, high priority, um, priority pathogens with critical pathogens receiving much less. So you get about 64% of the funding for therapeutics in human health um, for a high status priority pathogens and 33% going to, to critical priority pathogens. So the data that we have can be like a basis, a quantitative basis to, to help sort of uh, guide where we go next. You know, this is we're at the beginning of these conversations and I, I'm asked, where are we? Are we ready to set the, the, the targets? No, we're not. There's a lot of conversation with all stakeholders uh, to be had before we're able to, to go anywhere near a target. If we can set targets, how do, how do we really do this? So this is the start of the conversation conversation for this. I'll stop there. 
In fact, we have a very interesting point uh, from Lloyd, which James has also responded to on the issue of priority pathogens, saying that we need that list to evolve in a way that it into a priority indicators list, which is backed uh, by indicator specific target uh, product profiles to guide researchers and developers in their selection of projects, which is exactly what we are developing, which we're discussing now. The point that Amit started off is, are we ready for identifying therefore what is this pipeline and what are the priorities and where should the investment need? And then of course he says, we then need to provide examples of feasible clinical trial designs with which to evaluate new products in each of the indicate, indications. Aligning research with priority indicators, uh, TPPs, and feasible clinical trials would improve productivity of the pipeline. Um, can I ask for a response on that from Leslie and Richard, and then of course, James. Um, uh, Leslie, would you like to go first? This is a question on the chat box. Yeah, I, I, think, I think what Lloyd is really highlighting is that we need to leverage the, the infrastructures that we have already and be able to say, okay, we have this in place. And with COVID, we've developed much of the infrastructure that allowed us to respond quite quickly to, to the pandemic. And we haven't sort of utilized this properly at the moment to be able to do this for AMR. And we should be using that infrastructure uh, very well. So I agree very much with, with what, what Lloyd's saying, especially about the cl clinical trial infrastructure. It needs to be aligned. It needs to be a, a process, almost like passing the baton from early stage to market authorization. We need to be clear who the baton is being passed to. Interesting. Richard? Yes, I'll, I'll be very brief, um, and I, I totally agree with Leslie's response. Um, uh, the one thing I worry about with COVID is whether we learned all the right lessons. There, there were some great advances in platforms and some great opportunities for more coordination and collaboration, but there were also some real problems, things that just did not work well. And, and I do hope that the, the attention from governments and policymakers and so forth doesn't stray. Uh, there's always a risk that um, after a crisis, people just go back to their usual way of working. And I think it is really critical that we learn the lessons from the COVID response and also COVID preparation. The, the years of uh, research that went into coronaviruses before they were an imminent threat. And I think it again points to the importance of being prepared early and having that clear progression from basic research through the rest of the chain. Interesting. In fact, that's a whole area that we should really look at is lessons from COVID, uh, what we learned good and bad to mm -hmm. see how we bring it to this discussion. James? Yeah, briefly from me. So, um, Sunita, I'm going to bring it back to you and the Global Leaders Group, because I think the idea of, of trying to set some targets of what what does good look like in let's say 10 years for the pipeline because we don't have that as leslie said it's a really important gap currently there's no easy answer to that but, but if you don't have the target of what we're trying to get to all the discussion of what we need to do to get there you know is is difficult so i think the global leaders group is very well placed to uh, to to convene and to bring together those those conversations ahead of the um, you know ahead of the high level meeting next year because it wouldn't it be a really good outcome of the high level meeting to have you know endorsement from the heads of state on on that very question of what what are we what are we aiming for here as a global as a global R and D community um, and and how do we get there and how do we know if we're on track or or not right. So um, let's let's if you're up for it, let's let's see if we can all work towards uh, towards that. We've got some time, but not very much. No, I agree, James, and I think we should all work together to get this moving further. Amit, Rajeshwari, Gauri, last words from you before I wrap up. I just want to say thank you, everyone.
very, very important points, uh, lots of learnings for us. And I can tell you that we'll get back with more questions. We will also try and uh, share whatever best we can in terms of uh, what we have learned from uh, stakeholders like you. That's it for my side. Thank you, Amit. Uh, Rajeshwari? Uh, I think I would also like to uh, say thank you to the experts who spoke today and uh, the sense that i get is is a very positive sense uh, there is a there is a recognition to the problem uh, by all different stakeholders but but there is a positivity and my takeaways are uh, to be very uh, very crisp uh, there are four c's and four p's 4c is uh, conversation communication coordination and collaboration and four P's is prioritize, predictability, progress, and positivity. I think I would summarize this discussion within, the, within this eight uh, words and you know fit in uh, the relevant context. Uh, I would well like to keep it at that. Thank very you. well put. <laughs> I like the four P's. Uh, Gauri? Uh, so I would also like to just uh, thank everybody for being here. It was a great panel and a great discussion. And I think uh, everything already has been covered, but the integral uh, takeaway that I would take is that collaboration and partnership is a must. No, no one person can do this. And it's such a big problem and it's such a big crisis that uh, everybody needs to get on board. And I think there needs to be a collaboration and partnership. And I think we can solve this issue. Good. No, I think fascinating. As I wrap up, I think... This is the first of the conversations we're having. I think we've got a good sense, and I hope everyone agrees, of the nature of uh, the issues, both in terms of the crisis. We understand that the pipeline is drying up. We understand we have a particular problem when it comes to antibiotics, which is both in terms of the need to conserve the antibiotics and the need to provide access, which makes it a particular category of medicine, which is not... Um, so well funded uh, when it comes to pharma companies. It is also very clear to us that there is, there are ways in which governments are trying to work ahead. CABEX and the other organizations working on the push are helping to get more and more research on the table. Um, the R&D um, hub is helping to bring this conversation and bring, um, uh, join the dots in terms of what's happening, where are the gaps? And then of course, as James very clearly said, that we need, Big Pharma is also working and is concerned about this and is trying to coordinate action on it. Um, we have models now coming up also a pull from governments. The question that I still have, and I'll be very frank with you, and I hope we will address it, when we meet at the next meeting is, um, how are these pool incentives um, good enough? And um, are they going to be the right models as we move ahead, given the nature of the crisis and given what we discussed in terms of it being a much more global um, issue? And for me, um, as somebody who really very much believes in the concept of public funding, um, you know, how do you maximize that for public good? And that becomes a still a big issue that we need to discuss and we need to see what then are the approaches as we move ahead. But what is very clear is that there is, there is a need to do everything we can. And that's where we need to look at all approaches, not as something good or bad, but the learning that we can have from these to be able to see what more can be done. And I think that's the approach with which we certainly at CSC will continue to work on it. I also agree with uh, James, and I think it's a conversation that we must have the point about targets and the point about setting the priorities as we move ahead with, so that we focus the attention in terms of what's the roadmap, how many, what, what are the priority pathogens so that we can actually get a much more clearer understanding from um, both the global community in terms of commitment, but also more predictability for investment. And I think that's another area of work. So thank you again. I think we've, um, it's been fascinating. I've learned a lot. And thank you, James. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Rich, 
for agreeing to be part of it. And thank you, Team CSE, Amit, Rajeshwari, and Gauri, for the work that you have done. This has really been your work that, um, that we have put out today. And I hope that uh, we will continue um, on this journey to put out more and to stimulate more discussions on it and keep our sights uh, very firmly on the need to move the needle uh, so that we can get some things done at the big meeting coming up next year. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Fascinating.